Welcome back to the Coffee and Technology Podcast with Nick Castellano and Norbert Niederhauser. In part two of the miniseries, The Founders of Cropster, we speak to Martin Wiesinger, the co-founder and the CTO at Cropster. He'll give us insights into the technical side of Cropster and his story as a founder. Let's start the year off right, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel and give us a follow on social media. Norbert, welcome back to our the second part of this mini series, talking to all the co-founders of Cropster. How are you, man? How's it going? Good, Nick. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Nice. I'm super stoked for this episode. Um, today, we're speaking with Martin Wiesinger, uh, CTO of Cropster. And for me, especially in particular, this is exciting because I don't come from a technical background and I'm excited to learn as much as possible on the the tech side of things at Cropster. And it's going to be really exciting. Um and a, a big knowledge bomb is going to be dropped. So, Martin, <laughs> welcome to the to the podcast, man. How's it going? How are things in Austria? Hello, welcome, welcome. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. It has been a while, but I I was finally invited here. Uh, all things are good. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are looking forward to having snow uh, end of the week. So, mm-hmm. ski season can start. That's super cool, man. Um, well, maybe if we could just start off by giving us a quick intro, who you are, obviously, you know, who you are at Cropster, and then we can move on to some, some more, even more exciting things from there. Sure thing. Uh, well, uh, as, who, who am I? Um, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of, of Cropster uh, and, and uh, currently the CTO. Um, how how everything started? I I keep it briefly. I mean, I I was I I was thinking it's like it's it's a little bit with like most people ending up in coffee. It's not the straight line. Um, and uh, so I studied computer science at the same university as actually Norbert did, without knowing Norbert back then. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I nice. I got the opportunity for my for a project to go to Colombia uh, because someone over there uh, opened the program uh, to bring students in. Um, this someone was Norbert, <laughs> and <laughs> so I, I, I started in the in the in the research center, and we did a lot of like explorative work on how technology can actually help uh, people in the developing countries. Uh, one of the projects was like working in, in, in coffee, and. Originally, I thought I will stay in Colombia for about four months, and six years later, I finally returned to Austria, um, <laughs> nice. which, which was an amazing experience, I, I have to say. And and although I, coffee was for me nothing that I knew before, like in in the way that uh, like it it was a it was a beverage that I drank during uh, long coding hours in university. But there was no real connection to to it itself. Uh, my my connection to to the to the work that we we did a little bit was like uh, my parents are producers, so um, here in Austria. Uh, so I grew up on a farm, um, and nice. yeah, it was just interesting to see. I mean, for me, always the the, the experience that that. It really gripped me a lot. It's like when you talk to farmers and you you see like this uh, producers, uh, and you see this um, this this pride in doing work. Um, and I I I, I mm. always saw this with my parents. It's like it's not something. I mean, we always connected to our own work, and it's like yeah, what we do, we are really excited, and it's really. But if you, it's it's totally understandable that everyone in the craft doing their craft have have a lot of excitement for it and and this was when we went to a farm and you you, you talk to producers and like and what they do and how they think about it it's just like mm. it it felt like home to some degree because this is like uh this is also how, how how i was brought up and how my parents yeah. always looked at like the quality of the food so we have a small farm but it was always about how can we do it just like uh, doing things organic or or they were very early on in this wave of like like joining it and yeah taking some of this I, I didn't became a producer um, <laughs> I was not actually cut out for that uh, I, I really enjoy computers um, but but uh, I, I'm very happy that at least I can take some of that and, and bring it to a different craft so yeah, that's that's me. Nice. No, and that's super interesting because it makes me think of something. And I didn't know that you grew up on a farm, basically. That's super interesting. And now you're a CTO. So I'm wondering how uh, your, your upbringing on a farm 
has made an impact on the way you not even just see technology in 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 rural areas of the world, but specifically at Cropster when you first started, how that's made an impact on your perspective of creating technologies uh, or developing technologies for rural farmers around the world, producers, coffee producers. Sure. Um, yeah, when, when I started computer science, I mean, I worked a little bit before. I actually had a job before Cropster, uh, very briefly. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, but I, I quickly figured out that's not for me. And then I started computer science. And really going into the program, one of the first thoughts and like during the first year was already like, okay, what what I'm going to do with my life? Because I, I don't <laughs> want to work for a company uh, making things 10% faster to earn 10% more. This is like, that, that was never something that I felt like is rewarding. Um, although performance, hands down, is very important for us. Um, but it, it, it's just like a different. So it was this, this, this kind of struggle from the beginning on like, how can you, how can you apply your craft and how, how can you do something meaningful? Um, and yeah, I mean, gladly, uh, coffee, coffee came into my world and seeing like how, how you can, how can you apply and then, then starting to think how you can apply what you have learned to a different field, but, but like, how can you make it accessible to people? How can you, how can you something, do something abstract, like for, for, for what it is as a work and how can you make it something concrete um, in this, in this scenarios and how, how can you make it accessible to people that generally are not, really into technology. I mean, I, I can see this even with my parents. I mean, it's like, beside being like from a different generation, but on a farm level, I mean, Austrian farm level is a little bit different, but it's still not US mm. level. So so it's it's everything mm. is relatively small and all the big technology jumps are made for, for huge farms. Um, and a lot of the small mm. things and how, how can you even apply um, technology in a small scale? doesn't even yet exist that much so that that is always like this interesting of how can you how can you take this how can you bring something to to small scale farmers and still make it viable right it's not like you can make a super expensive system uh, but if at the end no one has access to it you you actually um, well missing the point mm -hmm. so i think it shaped a little bit this yeah. this approach of like how can you uh, bring it to to smaller or uh, like a uh, different different set of people more people yeah no that's super interesting i would have never thought of also separating technology like and making it accessible on a large scale and a small scale so it's a really interesting point you bring up um kind of bring it back to the origins of cropster um i so at the from my understanding at the time cropster was started either the iphone had not come out yet or it maybe just had come out uh can you tell us a little bit about like you know how how it was then developing a technology around the pre or start of the iPhone era versus now when everybody has iPhones. Yeah, the iPhone came out exactly as we started, um, and <laughs> I I remember it because we did already some work on it, but also living in Colombia at that time. It was not, I, I couldn't fully grasp what the shift is because it was mm. a device and it was a nice looking device, but we started Cropster. I mean, it's a powerful device, all, all those things, but mm -hmm. you you didn't use it in that way, right? We, we were there and we were thinking like, okay, how can we bring technology to producers? And mm. this is a very expensive device. If I just drop it, it breaks. So it's like, <laughs> this is not even this is not even cut out for what we want to do. It's like we we were always looking for cheap options. So it's like how can we just like bring it to more people and coming back to Europe, going back between Europe and and Colombia, and then you you see people actually using those devices. You are like, oh, they they are very differently used here than that what we had back then there. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, being very interested uh, in technology, like all of us. Um, we did some studies and, and we saw that people could easily, more easily understand how, how the technology works, bringing that to a farm, testing it with farmers. Um, but, but it was like the struggle of like, 
yeah, it's still expensive. <laughs> and <laughs> what what can you do to actually but um, do that 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 gives gives still power? Um, and uh, and how can you use the power of those devices? Um, mm. It was not clear in the in the beginning. I think it becomes more and more like accessible, but back yeah. then it was like yeah. I guess one point was also uh, connectivity. So there was mm. uh, you know the iPhone lives off being connected. Any any phone now, any smartphone lives off being connected to the internet, and. I mean, in 2007, there was oh, there was no internet at, at a farm level, and it took or it it started to to be there, right? So we we saw internet in the in the villages, we saw internet in the in the uh, receiving stations in some beer houses. <clears throat> so it's um, yeah, there was there was a lot of uh, uh, changes, of course, and huge investments in that time. So, uh, especially from 2007 to 2010, every half year or year, when we went back to a farm, first there was no no connectivity, and suddenly there was, and mm. and not just just some connectivity. Some had like better internet than I had in my home, um, with all the the mobile the mobile infrastructure put in place, and they of course made a technology jump from mm. basically zero to hundred. Mm, yeah. They didn't have to put in old technology first and then gradually improve. They had nothing until they had the best available at that time. Yeah. So that makes me think of the device you you always tell me about, Norbert, and I always forget the name of it, but the... the HP iPad. <laughs> HP iPad, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, <laughs> so I've obviously heard Norbert talk a lot about it, and it seems to have been a, an integral part to Krupster's start on farms. Uh, or on on uh, in yeah on, on on coffee farms. Can you tell me a little about that, Martin? And <laughs> as the CTO, what that meant for Cropster at the time? <laughs> I, I I don't have such a deep connection to this device. I have to say, um, but it was the first it was the first one of the first handhelds that we had um, to to test things out. Um, but but also thinking thinking about the the iPhone when it started and and even when we started, the there was no app store, right? So there was, mm -hmm. there were only those apps that were on there, and and you were limited in what you could do. Uh, that only changed a few years later. So, mm -hmm. yes, you could do a little bit more, um, but no. Uh, seeing seeing how how things are used and how how well designed things and i'm not talking about about the, the device that we had but uh go, going into like uh handhelds but but also going going down then to the iphone and the, the studies we did um how user experience has such a big impact how mm. how it's a make or break how that also the the the, the barriers that you try to jump with technology not not only language but but understanding and how if we think critical and make the right decisions, we can bring technology to 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 a world where technology is not readily available where uh, as for us. So this was, I think, really critical in seeing the the potential uptake if you make it accessible. If you if you give people, it's not there is no. I don't care about technology. No, there is. I don't have technology, and and technology is not made for me. There was also this like sentiment of like, yeah, it's made for other people. But if you make it for people, people will use it because there is benefit. And and so this was this was very. I, I think the this like studies and and talking to people and seeing like how how it worked that that was crucial to to go deeper into also i think long term how how cropster works we are very very fond um of of working with people closely because we see how important it is that we understand uh what is needed but but learning from those experiences and bringing those back in order to make our our tools actually usable is is such mm. a, a crucial part of our work but what you just mentioned martin that's really a paradigm shift uh in in every every everywhere uh from 
there was a device and people needed training and specific training to use that device. So you had to go through a course and you had to like uh, hours and days of learning. And that shifted to, it's not the human who has to adapt to the device. It's the device who adapts to the humans. And I think that shift happened around that 2007, 2010 um, range uh, when we went to the field, when the first uh, usability conferences came out and, and the, the whole uh, um, human, human computer interaction field was more studied. I think it's fascinating and uh, it remind, reminds me when I got my mom uh, her first phone, right? The only thing I, I told her is like, here's on, here's off, and here's a button to click. And I didn't really want to show her more, but I also didn't need to show her more. And she never used a computer before. So this is also like the, the jump from old technology, like a keyboard and many buttons and, and a mouse where you can do all kinds of things to the mouse is your finger and there's only one button or f three buttons or I don't know. Um, and it's amazing. So it's not that she would, would use it to the max, but she was used for a few very meaningful things uh, and changing the way she communicates, right? Hmm. Away from phone or asking someone for assistance to send an email to herself being able to send a direct message via a chat program. No, yeah, that's super interesting. So before we get into like the more tech stuff, like, you know, what it means to be a CTO and some of the crops or technologies, I have one more thing that's kind of I'm curious about. And these days, like a lot of companies, a lot of tech companies especially go for the SA, SA, software as a service model and, and, and meaning behind that and whatnot. But from my understanding at the time, crops or went immediately for that. Um, you know, so I guess, was that at the time a visionary route or was that kind of like a not that common to do? And either, whether it was or wasn't, why did you decide to immediately go um, go for that model? Ah, great question. Um, if you, if you, it's, it's funny if you look at the long-term uh, development of, of, of software. So we actually started out in 1960 with like mainframes, these big servers where everyone was actually working on a device shared the same device because resources were very expensive mm. and only after we, we got personal computers and people starting to actually install software on their own device then it was mm. away from like this central um central computing device and i think it was the yeah it's 2000 where where software really took off and then <laughs> took a nose dive immediately um but this is where <laughs> Where this this is around where the first software as a service companies started. So there was like uh, Salesforce was the first actually building a model around it, but okay. it was not that common, um, and it was always viewed as um, well as especially by by bigger companies or like this is not something that that will actually work. Um, it was crucial to us um, less of the business model. But the way, I mean, business model in, in the broader sense, yes. The, the thing is, we wanted to do something for a smaller group of people with mm. less economical standing. And back then, when you wanted to buy uh, a packaged software, I mean, I'm not sure, Nick, if you, if you have ever seen that, the CDs coming like in a package, yeah, you yeah. actually went to a store and, and, and <laughs> bought them. Um, they were super expensive. If you if you if you think about uh, Adobe Photoshop that was around, yeah, yeah. Oh, floppy yeah. disks, no, but yes. <laughs> um, well, they, even DV DVDs came as packages. Everything, everything yeah. was packaged. Um, yeah. But it was very expensive to produce. Distribution costs were high, mm. uh, making the entire software expensive. Mm. Um, also, you only went from a one-time sale. We. We started out, um, and as I said before, it's like the the, the, the interactive part, talking to, to customers, uh, talking to to partners, friends. It was like very very much like changing on a rapid scale. So producing something and then shipping it as a package um, is not really a model that you can do. Uh, and furthermore, if you want to bring down costs, you need to look at ways that how can you provide a service 
where everyone chips in, but it gets better for everyone. And this is where I think this this software as a service uh, paradigm is so powerful and so so beautiful mm. because it's if you really have software that you do create and and it's the same for 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 ten years, okay, then then you have you can do one time sales, mm. but our software it changes every week and not everyone sees all the changes that we do but it's a constantly involving thing and and so we 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 need some way or we always needed some way to uh to have it in have it distributed but also like um working and like also uh, being able to be sold to a to to a, to a point where we can reach a lot of people um, with with minimal distribution cost, with minimum cost for everyone involved, but still <laughs> making a living out of it because well, it's also part of it. So that that's why, although it was not common to use software as a service, or it it, it really started later on to be really that big. Um, it it was the necessity and also like the the, the thing that we saw in it that that it actually f- did fit in our in our way of thinking and our model. Man, my mind just went. <laughs> I don't know. I would have never. I would have never thought of it that way. Like, I went from not really thinking much about S, S software as a service. Now I'm like, my mind is spinning about all these different questions that I'm gonna say for another time. <laughs> but uh, so now I'm kind of moving on to like the technical things. Um, just to kind of ease into it. If you can tell tell us a little bit about what it means to be a CTO, Chief Technology Officer. Um, in your own words, um, you know, obviously last week or a few weeks ago, I was in Austria and I was finally in person of where a lot of, where our, where the development happens. And I learned a little bit about the infrastructure side of things, but it, what I heard was a small piece of it. And I'd love to hear, you know, your, your take on that and what you do as, as a CTO. Um, well, <laughs> you wear, you wear a lot of hats, but. I mean, in the in the in the essence, it is about um, thinking or like applying ways on how where where we are going um, mm. and what what is relevant. And we often talk about like uh, relevant innovation because there is so much that you can do, um, but you always need to think about: Does it move the needle? Does it even make sense? Uh, does this technology that 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 is super hype at the moment does it fit into into our world and 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 is it still relevant? Um, we are also um, we we also are not like a Facebook. We are also not the Google that has like <laughs> um, thousands of engineers sitting around that need to reinvent everything all the time because well they don't have anything else to do. Well, Pardon, maybe maybe they do, but uh, it sometimes feels to me it's like um, <laughs> they have all these resources to deploy um, to 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 a lot of projects, and we must be very diligent in, in what we do. So it is like a lot of reviewing of like, okay, if we go down this route, is it relevant in ten years? Can we can we still uh, leverage what we have done and not have to? redo things over and over and over again because redoing is not progress it's like redoing is like yeah you you you're treading water because you're not you're not mm-hmm. taking the next steps so yeah it's 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 um thinking about technology it's, it sounds way more fun if i say it um <laughs> it's, it's it's a lot about really uh Trying to to see where the where the puck is going, and making making small small changes along the way. Right, and how, how do you stay on top of of that, Martin? Um, I mean, with all the technology changes, as you say, every day there is a lot of things you can do, uh, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. How how do you how do you keep informed? How do you keep on top of that? There is, of course, certain industry blogs. Uh, about technology, um, reading, lots of reading, and mm-hmm. trying out things. I it's it's one of those things to to actually do things and then see how they work and how they they work in a in a in a concept uh, to to actually get a feeling for it. And 
also experience <laughs> so you you're not you're you're not the hype man anymore after after doing this more than 10 years we're like oh we need to do this it's like well let's let's <laughs> think about it. does it make sense in our context um <laughs> and i i think keeping a, a positive attitude to technology because it's I, I'm a strong believer in technology. I, I'm, I'm actually, I do think that technology can make the world better, and mm -hmm. I think that's that's important too to to not get hung up on on, on different things. Um, and and sometimes you you, yeah, you make wrong decisions and and you have to live mm -hmm. with them, but it it doesn't invalidate everything else that you do. So yeah, as in as in any any part of life, <laughs> yeah, <sure> right? So. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of experience. Yeah, and, and 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 the good thing is now. I mean, when we started out, we were three. Uh, now we have a <laughs> we have a group of really intelligent people working with us, and I I'm a general thinker, generalist, and I know a lot of things uh, to a to a degree where it's dangerous, but. <laughs> the nitty gritty and then actually seeing you can come up with ideas but you 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 have people to actually then go to fact check and then have people also like bringing in key information that they know from the, the depth of their the actual work and also saying mm -hmm. like does this work in this context which you can only grasp on a high level this is where it then becomes very important to talk to people to actually see and how how they feel and how how they see it fit and how they actually think we can make it work for the next five to 10 mm -hmm. years. Enjoying this episode of the Coffee and Technology Podcast? This podcast would not be possible without the support of Cropster. Whether it's tracking your harvest yields, roastery and inventory management, or simply tracking brew recipes, Cropster Origin, Cropster Roast, and Cropster Cafe can help streamline your workflows and help you operate more efficiently. So, you know, that makes me think of something when you, when you say you're a believer of technology. Um, so there's a lot of uh, also... A a lot of people that are skeptical of technology for their own reasons and whatnot. And Norbert have, and I have talked about this in the past, but as a CTO on an ethical side, are there certain, um, are there certain limitations that you and your team, team, you and your team need to have in place or to make technology remain human? Obviously with some of the bigger technology companies, there's a lot of um, those kinds of ethical questions that are posed and, issues that come out and i'm wondering what your take on that is and how do you i mean what wh how do you keep those limitations in place from 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 in, in, in maintaining a technology as a human as, as humanly accessible as possible yeah what, one point to that i mean and this is also core core to what we do um and we should always be reminded about is the data that that gets into our system is not our data. We don't, mm. we are not, we are not the Facebook. <laughs> we are not like, yeah, give us our data and we now run off with it and sell it to someone else. This is, mm. this is not what we do. Um, we want to make the information that you give to us useful to you, but we are not selling it. We are not mm. uh, trying to, to make a quick buck on, on, on other people's uh, lives. Mm. And this is this is very very central, um, and yeah, it's it, it's trying to to really connect with people and also seeing where 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 we are. Um, but yes, trying trying to stay human is a is a is a good is a good way to to frame it because I. I I can see that technology can be isolating. It can be like really like something that's that that's not for me part. Mm. Uh, but we know that we can take this away. That we can explain things. That we we can make we can make it useful. I guess that's that's the core to it, right? To keep the eye on the price. What what are we trying to do here? Uh, we're not uh, develop a software company for the sake of technology. We are there to to serve a purpose. And that's why it's important to have a clear value statement, to review that, to look at how are we serving best and whom are we serving. And as long as we keep that very clear, uh, I think the rest follows. 
So it's not only about the technology and not only, but there's always the temptation of power, right? Mm. It's always there. If you sit in the middle and, and there's like certain things you potentially could do, but that would only be self-serving. And that's only a very short-sighted thing. Um, and I think that's also the part why Crops is already almost 15 years old, because people trust us with their data and trust us, um, our service, for f because we, we deal with it in the right way. Mm. And, and one other example is when, when the GDPR, the, the uh, data protection, the European data protection uh, law uh, was signed in two years ago, <clears throat> that project was very uh, was was immediately uh, taken up by management, not just by like oh marketing take you take care that the, our website looks okay. It's like no, that's not it. So it, management took care of it, and then uh, Martin actually, and maybe you want to talk about that, or maybe you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, it's uh, you know it's a it's a it, it's a big thing. Yeah. This is not a simple thing. So we really had to do trainings. We had to think about the data again, how to protect it and how to make um, make it useful and uh, and 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 sustainable for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 working. I mean, working <laughs> in technology, you kind of always wear your tinfoil hat. Um, and, and I I'm I'm also pro gdpr person so uh, personally i i do i do believe that there must be restrictions in place that what we can do so i'm i'm wholeheartedly is it is it a lot of work and and and, and some of mm -hmm. them very bureaucratic and, and really where you think like how should any small company do this um <laughs> but but as a as a as an idea as a um as, as what it that we that we have to have boundaries and 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 if the companies cannot do it on their own sometimes you have to superimpose them but uh, we 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 weren't far i mean we are not far off from the gdpr it's just like having these trainings having this like restrictions having this like documentation that you need but um in, in general we believe very strongly in this in mm. um having having your your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. Um so on some on some of the the technical sides of crops are now specifically on the products, um I think it'd be cool to kind of maybe start with a story of of one that I find fascinating and and that's with the fidgets. And I've heard the story from Norbert and Andreas of when the fidget was first created out of a Lego. But you being the the technology guy of uh, of the company, what was your what's your experience with that? How, how did you create it? How did you feel about it? I mean, I want to hear your your side of it. It's interesting. So, yeah, I I did the soldering <laughs> of, the, of the first boards. Um, so so Norbert built the Norbert actually built the the Lego. Um, enclosure uh i soldered uh, stuff on it um but yeah the, the the progress was also i mean from 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 the software perspective uh very interesting and as a also a good good example of how how it changed and how how we were able to just like progress and not just say like well that's it you have to deal with it but handing it out to people um getting the feedback saying what works what doesn't um building a structure around it building but but also trying out bold things and uh things that no one else has done before to to actually say like well to a certain degree we very much believe in that but mm. we still need also all the feedback coming back and saying like yeah well the idea is great but you should you should adapt this and this things and this this was uh, over the years seeing how how it how it changed at, at its core. It's very much the same. Uh, it's as hard as it is to say sometimes. It's like the the core principles that it uses. It it is now way more flexible. It, it's mm. way more advanced and it pulls in more more things. But uh, the original idea of it has never changed. And I actually. 
this, this, that the entire software has never been rewritten. It had always only be extended, and 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 that is after after fifteen years in software, it's 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 very it's an impressive feat. So, but yeah, it's uh, it was it was a great a great great experience. Yeah, and it's not it, it didn't end yet. <laughs> There's more to come. Right. I mean, when you look at it, right, we started first with the hardware problem how do we can get how can we get data uh, from a roasting machine into the computer mm. and once we figured that out uh, then it started like how can we make that data more accessible more meaningful and and that's what i think the wildest ride was uh, and i'm very happy that the base concepts stayed in place so that's that's a very good sign of if you really think about it, uh, the the problem and what is the what is the heart of the problem and when I mean, you tackle that then you can really build on it and it's like i always compare when you software to building a house right so if you build it on the right place it will not sink it will not get damaged it will with, uh, with, uh, withstand the earthquakes and so on so you, you have to find the right site and you have to find the right building the right materials for what you're trying to do then your house can stay for a very long time and be very useful for many many generations even if you know usage changes a little bit and um yeah martin <laughs> yeah no I, i just want to add on to something what you said which which i find i mean we started out with the with the hardware problem but the, also the, the thing of like collecting information collecting data uh basically collecting data um and and i i, I think that's such an important step from we can collect so much data about everything in, in, in our world. And nowadays with IoT, it becomes even more and broader. Um, but you're collecting data is just the first and very basic step. This is mm -hmm. like you, you have achieved, well, you now have technology that you can collect it, but, but it's to the end user, it's of no use yet. So now you need to take this and, and be and take a critical look at it and say like okay what can we make out of it and this is where we're actually in the roasting intelligence and then saying like okay bean curve so it's like you have you have a temperature temperature changes over time and then it's like okay and now you have like what can you do what what else can you do with this information what what are people doing in their head to with with what they see on on their roaster at this point of time it's like how do they project forward what what else needs to go on and how can you use what you have and think about this terms of what like a human does and how can you help with it because it's not mm. about replacing it's never about replacing something but there is like a very much that you have to do while you run a rose tree and you have several other things to do but now you should calculate in your head forward have like where where will my roast curve be like in in five ten fifteen seconds from now and computers are really great in that they they are really bad in some other things but <laughs> but doing computation is like that's the core of every computer and how can you how can you leverage in what a computer is good for and infuses with with that what the human does and 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 build and build like something around it and yeah this this is like this has always been so it's like going back to say like the basics are in place the basics are in place is like we collect data we collect data from from a drum but we have done so much more with the basics now now that we have learned and also got the feedback on like okay we have solved question a now we have b c and d and and now we can turn to those with 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 a collection of information that or data that we already have and 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 use it and, and and put it to use and also now that people are like further in like their understanding of like what's going on they can ask new questions so it's like our job is to provide answers to questions um that that we create on the other end with like uh solutions that we produce mm -hmm. so it's this cycle mm -hmm. of like going forward and and uh doing more About that, doing more, Martin. Um, want to talk a little bit about uh, what started with the roasting intelligence and reading data from the roasting machine has evolved into into more. Uh, now we have like sensor networks and stuff. Can can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. I I, I think it, 
it, it all started with roasting intelligence. Um, and and the and, and I think it, it goes back to what, what I said before with people asking more questions. Um, because you, you you take the roasting and <laughs> I, and already you you know when when we started out, I mean um, that what some of the ideas were back then on how roasting works, right? It's a function between the time that it is something in there, but whatever happens inside. Um, now, now we have way more information of what's happening inside. Um, so we have had these conversations with like customers that say like, well, I'm roasting the entire year and there's like one time in the year where it's, where it's really great, we, where we really hit uh, the spot and where, where the coffee comes out great. And then there's other times it doesn't. And like having this information and then being, oh, seeing like, okay, this is actually related to like, climatical uh like uh, or environment like changes mm. and mm. and now you're like oh and then but now you still have this thing is like okay i do the same things i i, I reproduce i mean I, I i repeat what what i've done before and still coffee comes out differently still the same coffee mm. and like okay what's now it's like okay maybe my my green coffee wasn't on the same temperature. <laughs> so mm. it's like, okay, how do I store my green coffee? It's like, okay, then then you go back to go to the storing facility, look at this, and it's like, okay, you have like a storing facility. Okay, is the temperature actually the same everywhere? It's like, how how is that different from if I, if I put my coffee on the top of a shelf somewhere in, in the left far corner or in the right far corner? It's like, what, what's going on? Learning, learning about this implication, how... How if my my temperature in my my storing facility? How does this actually impact coffee over time? If I can mm. keep it stable, can, can keep it to the right temperature, I can store coffee longer, and and this this all comes out because you you now solved one issue, which is mm. like you now understand how how one process uh, impacts uh, your quality, but now you find new variables <laughs> mm -hmm. that actually impact your coffee further and 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 we have not gone to the farm level right i mean it's like if you even talk about soil and you talk climate but but this is how 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 the, the progression happens it's like it's, it's it's going back and 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 looking at, at at one part solving one part uh adding um uh, additional uh, the possibility of, of having more questions and and trying to to then find solutions that will then allow us to answer those questions again. And once we have those questions, <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's more questions because this, this is this is the nature of um, of of, of um, trying to 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 figure. We as humans try to figure out how how things work, and we need data mm -hmm. for it. And but we also need to be there. We we need to have already understood a certain level um, to to. To fully fully grasp and then make these connections and i think that's the i mean that's what what happens with this added sensors also there was a huge technology shift um the last 10 years more and more sensors became available and they are uh, come come available at a really favorable price point so that's it's affordable to people to put sensors in and um i don't know in my head it just goes when i go back go back in time when we did research Right, we, we are collecting 100 data points or 100 different, we asked 100 different questions, but what we really wanted to know is what are the 20 thriving uh, variables to really understand or to really control? Mm. Uh, because you can always ask everything uh, and really get nowhere uh, if, you, if you don't understand the correlation between those things. And I think that's a little bit the segue into uh, where where basically human brains um i wouldn't say stop but uh where computers again can help us figure out patterns um and uh, martin you know uh, that's that's the keyword ai artificial intelligence machine <laughs> learning those those things yeah i i also wanted to say I, I think it's like we almost came now full circle when when you said like <laughs> um now that we have technology that is so cheap that we can put it in things mm -hmm. and this is thanks to the iphone and, and whatever came afterwards because those devices they were so mass produced and then it's like it, it made they have so many things in there that actually mm -hmm. then enabled the production of so many other things 
that would otherwise right. be impossible to build. So that that, that is a great great reason, uh, mm-hmm. or great great uh, thing for the iPhone that I didn't have on my um, on, on my point of view. But yeah, um, <laughs> we we as humans um, are good in seeing patterns. I would say. Uh, even if they are not there, there is like certain things when it comes to if you have a lot of data, it becomes really hard to sift through. Mm. And this is where uh, what Norbert alerted to it's like uh, machine learning uh, can mm. can actually, I mean, it's like artificial intelligence, which is an encompassing term for other other things like uh, machine learning, which is a subtopic of it. But there you you're going for like okay, I have this amount of data and and i try to figure out how how the end result came came out of it um but it's also they are very important to to remind one that the principle of like you can only make reasonable assumptions based on if you have good enough data mm-hmm. because if your data isn't good you're you will still get the result. I mean, you can always <laughs> find something mm. in something. This is like, and, and computers mm-hmm. are no different in this this aspect as humans. You can find a pattern. So you should really start out with like a, a hypothesis on like what you want to prove because just taking data, running it, and then say like, well, now I know X. It's It's not really scientifically speaking a good approach um mm. because you 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 actually want to know if x is in the data set or like can i find x because i believe that x is is impacted so um this is uh and and also there with with, with machine learning it it goes hand in hand with with humans um i'm 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 very I think very much about this. This is like, this is not, there's certain things that that humans are excellent in. And and maybe there will be a day where we will have like these electronic tongues that can taste them. But but still, <laughs> it doesn't, I mean, you can, you can measure compounds, right? And you can then abstract and say like, well, for, I don't know, a certain group, this might be interesting. But Coffee is so much more about like personal experience. So what you what you tasted, how how your upbringing was, how, what what you like. Then I think it's mm-hmm. it's very it's impossible to to make this generalized like models that then you would go like, yeah, Nick, exactly. And, and even then, if it's Nick and, and Norbert, they they share different tastes, and we still need to cater to those. And I think that that's that's a human job to understand humans and to communicate and the, the the thing where we can apply artificial intelligence is very much in um very mechanized tasks this like this forward looking this is like okay as we do like in the the roasting intelligence with like predicting something that happens based on a lot of data sets that we have it happened before so it will happen again but but it doesn't tell us about the how how it will then be for Nick, and mm. um, mm-hmm. so I, I think this is this is also where where we very much strike the balance, where we want to help um, as as we do with everything else to to make the life easier for 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 our for the people we work with, mm. uh, while still not dehuman de- dehumanizing de- dehumanizing dehumanizing yeah damn it. <laughs> English is not my first language, um, but yeah, you you get the point. This is this is what we um, that that that's the goal. Yeah, and I th- and I think one point to that that's really interesting that the word makes you think of is that um, humans have and bring out emotion that like maybe a computer a computer can tell us this this and that, but at the end of the day, it's up to the human to have the emotion to bring the emotional side of it, and I think that's what makes what makes it uh, more special is the emotional aspect of it. Yeah, and, and 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 creativity. Yeah. I I think you, you you should not, or you, you. I mean, can is always like who who knows what we ever can in in in, in the future. But it's um it's yeah. I I think we are humans. We we like to work with humans. <laughs> we I, I, at least I even even <laughs> if I love to work with computers. Um, I, I think this is <laughs> right. this is what we 
what 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 where we share a connection and which is very important uh mm. to everything that we do and that we we, we should preserve yeah and i think that's it that's also one of those looking at the strengths and weaknesses of each um like this uh, you were just mentioning nick uh the uh emotions right um computers don't have emotions humans have emotions that's uh many times that's a strength and then sometimes it's a failure and you want to make sure with certain calculations uh, when you really look at, at at data and patterns you don't want to have emotions you want to look at the problem from a neutral perspective mm. and that gives you new insights so that's where where i think computers have a certain strength yeah but then uh, again it needs that emotion to get there why do we even care well, we care because we're emotional, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, what what are our ideas? That's creativity, and so there's 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 so much around it. So, and that fascinates me. And also, I think as Martin said in the beginning, we wanted to do something, do not working on an optimization problem. We want to do something with impact, mm -hmm. impacting people ultimately. And I think that makes all the difference in. Uh, what you do and for whom you work and and why you why you work um and that's i think that's so the mission the mission is super important yeah i couldn't say it better norbert just summed it up very nicely here that's why i said it <laughs> <laughs> nice no uh that was amazing martin thank you for sharing your your knowledge and thoughts and for norbert for chiming in as well i learned a a great deal today and it was very really special. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Martin. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Coffee and Technology Podcast. To learn more about Cropster, subscribe to this podcast and be sure to follow us on social media. And for more educational content, be sure to visit cropster.com forward slash learn.